A career in drug trafficking is like a firework shooting for the sky. It goes up fast, makes a lot of noise, there's a moment of flash and glamour, but then it all comes down, turn it into ash and soot. The law, rivals, and often drug traffickers' own allies almost always end their success prematurely. Pablo Escobar, the king of Colombian snow story, is the apex tale of how bright but fast the star of a drug trafficker burns out. Welcome to Nutty History. Today, let's find out how rich Pablo Escobar was and how he spent his ill-gained fortune. Born to a modest-earning farmer and teacher, Escobar was worth a whopping $37 billion by the time he was in his 30s. He was one of the richest persons not only in Colombia and South America, but the entire world. At his peak, in addition to his assets in cash, he also had $10 billion worth of drugs waiting to be shipped to Mexico and eventually to the United States. But that wasn't always the case. Even though Pablo Escobar and his cousin Gustavo Gavaria hailed from middle-aged families that were doing good in a decent locality of Medellin, it wasn't enough for the two of them. The two cousins dropped out of school and began forging diplomas, stealing tombstones, abducting businessmen, and later committing grand theft auto, which earned them their first jail visit in 1974. This arrest turned out to be the turning point in Escobar's life. Soon after their release, the pair of cousins turned their attention toward drug trafficking with a focus on Snow White. This was Escobar's first taste of real riches. And soon, along with his allies, Escobar formed the Medellin Cartel, which put him on the map of the entire world. At the height of its power, the Medellin Cartel dominated the cocaine trade, earning an estimated $420 million a week. Escobar was receiving millions of dollars in cash each day through his drug sales and other legitimate as well as legitimate businesses that he had started after becoming rich. It's absurd to think after knowing that, that when Pablo was nothing but a petty thief, he was barely making $3 a day. In 1984, his wealth crossed a million dollars, and there was no looking back for him as his assets multiplied nearly every hour from there on. Naturally, such huge piles of cash were beyond management through laundering, so Pablo began investing in safe houses to store his cash. Pablo Escobar wasn't just buying these lavish top-of-the-class manners with his money, he was also storing his money in them like they were vaults. Money bills had been found under couches, beds, floor tiles, buried under the soil on lawns of these properties, and they don't even account for a substantial amount of Escobar's wealth as more money is hiding somewhere that nobody except the deceased Pablo Escobar knows. Nicholas Escobar, the nephew of Pablo, found decades-old currency bills worth $18 million in plastic bags hidden inside the walls of his apartment in 2020. This happened 27 years after his uncle's death in a police encounter. Nicholas inherited this apartment from Pablo after his death. Interestingly, it wasn't even the first time he found such wads of cash poking through walls or floor tiles in this apartment. Such apartments are a very small part of a very grand collection of properties Pablo Escobar amassed in a fleeting amount of time. The jewel of his real estate crown was Hacienda Napolis, a 7,000-acre estate located between Bogota and Medellin. Named after the city of Naples in Italy, Hacienda Napolis cost somewhere around $63 million to Escobar back in the day. It included a soccer field, huge lifelike dinosaur statues, artificial lakes, a bullfighting arena, a classic car collection hangar, not a garage, a hangar, as well as an airstrip for his drug trafficking, planes, a tennis court, and a zoo. Yes, a zoo. We'll come back to that one later. Moreover, it was the meeting spot for the leaders of the Medellin cartel, Gonzalo Rodriguez Cacha, Carlos Leder, the Ochoa Vasquez brothers, among others. Escobar had many visitors, both related to his criminal activities and others who would go there on vacation. La Manuela was another castle of his dreams, which he constructed in the municipality of El Penol, and he named it after his youngest daughter. This property was targeted many times by Los Pepes, the paramilitary group that played a major part in bringing Escobar down. Spanning eight hectares, La Manuela also had a soccer field, a swimming pool, and a round structure to the main house. Interestingly, while authorities in the U.S. were unable to get hold of Escobar, Pablo Escobar was purchasing safe houses in the United States as well. 
the most infamous of them being La Casa Rosada in Miami, Florida. This property was located in a privileged area of Miami Beach with a striking view of the sea and a perfect location to build a pier. Now, authorities managed to seize the property in 1987. Interestingly, in 2014, Christian de Bardois purchased the property in hopes of finding Escobar's hidden treasures by demolishing the construction. He ended up selling it in 2020. Other properties included Casa Magna in Mexico in the infamous prison he built for himself, La Queretral, among a total of 141 homes he purchased in the entirety of his life. He also bought and constructed residential buildings for his men in the Caribbean islands, which are now nothing but ruins and shelter for local animals. Most of the other properties are now under the control of their respective governments and are turned into tourist attractions, restaurants, or theme parks. Escobar, Gavaria, and their associates, Letter, the Ochoa brothers, and Gacha never imagined before how much U.S. dollars would pour in when they started trafficking Snow White across the ocean. The sheer quantity of currency bills was so overwhelming that, according to George Young, cash became more of a problem than a profit. The money management problem was so tedious that it began to suck all of the fun out of the entire operation. These traffickers, including Escobar, tried to convert dollars into pesos with willing Colombian banks but there was so much currency conversion they could offer. So, as stated earlier, Escobar began to stuff his houses with cash. But when they also had no space left, he had to look elsewhere beyond Colombia. As the currency flooding in was dollars, Escobar decided to send it back to U.S. banks. These banks had rooms set up with counting machines and even employees from the bank in special rooms reserved for Escobar and his allies. But these sorts of transactions were calling for U.S. authorities' attention. According to observers, Escobar's men were smuggling cash out and then dumping it onto non-interest-bearing checking accounts, $250 million or more, annually. When U.S. banks became too hot in the mid-80s, Escobar began to fly his money to offshore banking havens such as the Bahamas, Aruba, the Caymans, and the British Virgin Islands. Pablo Escobar bought a Learjet specifically for flying his cash. Though there has been more regulation in modern times, this method is still quite popular among drug traffickers. However, Escobar and Gavaria's personal preference was trade-based money laundering, a technique they developed like an art form. Pablo Escobar did this by buying easily solid items such as clothes or electronics from a legitimate company in the United States and then sold the items on the other side of the border for pesos. It was an effective way to clean large amounts of cash. Escobar also worked with accountants, including his brother, to exploit the banking systems in the United States and Europe. Out of all of Pablo Escobar's methods of laundering money, depositing amounts smaller than $10,000 to avoid the Bank Secrecy Act reporting regulation was the most popular. It didn't take a rocket scientist to acknowledge that it took a lot of brain power, strategy, tactics, innovations, and ingenuity from Pablo Escobar to make him so successful. He may not have been moral or legitimate, but he was a genius, no doubt. There was a time when Pablo Escobar had a monopoly over the entire east coast of the U.S.'s drug market. His rivals, such as the founders of the Cali Cartel, who were also legitimate businessmen, were no match for his domination of the industry until authorities began cracking down hard on Pablo Escobar's operation. He wasn't just a genius at work. Pablo knew how to party as well. He earned billions and he spent billions as a billionaire playboy would. His estate, Hacienda Napolis, had over 1,500 employees and three zoos to entertain his guests, along with a petrol station as well. His parties would include go-kart and bike races inside his estate, bullfighting, and tours of his zoos displaying exotic birds, horses, elephants, rhinos, and hippos, some of which are still roaming there. These drug-fueled parties had loud music, gambling in the in-house casino, hot young girls, a spa, and plenty of wealth flaunting around the sculpture garden. The nearby cottages were also beautifully appointed for guests and Escobar himself, with planters, hanging baskets, and luxurious upholstery and drapes. One of them had a bathroom built like a bunker, with reinforced cement walls that must have been more than three feet thick. Escobar was so rich by the mid-80s that he had offered to clear Colombia's debt of $10 billion if he would be exempt from any extradition treaty. To save himself from the U.S.'s attempt to bring him to justice, Pablo also put a lot of effort into winning the support of the Colombian population. Pablo Escobar was responsible for over 4,000 deaths. 
but he also spent money building hospitals, stadiums, and housing for the poor to bolster his image as a Colombian Robin Hood. He also purchased a lot of stocks in one of the biggest soccer teams in South America, Atletico Nacional. Players like Faustino Espria, Juan Pablo Angel, Ivan Cordoba, Andres Escobar, and Rene Higuita, who pulled off that scorpion kick against England, were basically on the payroll from Pablo Escobar at that time. To keep himself out of the clutches of the law, Pablo Escobar also invested a lot in his political campaign and managed to be elected to an alternate seat in the country's Congress in 1982. However, that made the spotlight on him brighter, and he was forced to resign two years later. The ambitions of Pablo Escobar had no ends, as he was dreaming of becoming the president of the country one day. But the law was chasing him wherever he would go, and in the late 80s, Pablo Escobar was the seventh richest man in the world. He was also a fugitive. As there was virtually no end to his cash reserves, he managed to live on the run mostly without any issue. But there is so much money can buy. When Manuela got sick while the Escobar family was in hiding, Pablo burned nearly $2 million in bills to keep his daughter warm. The Colombian government, meanwhile, seized his enormous fleet of 142 planes, 20 helicopters, 32 yachts, and two submarines. The rivals took care of his prized classic car collection, sending it up in smoke. There was a time in his life when he would weigh the cash instead of counting it, and it was believed that at a time he had 40 tons of it. He would also write off 10% of cash every year to rats chewing and destroying it. Rats. But when authorities caught up and defeated him, all the wealth in the world could not bring him back. After his death, most of his assets were seized by authorities, but there was plenty of wealth to share among the family and relatives he had left behind. Pablo Escobar's wife inherited up to $10 million, which have helped her to lead a dignified life along with her son. His dearest daughter, Manuela, is currently worth over $100 million. But there is no denying that the world will never forget how the Escobar family came up with their fortune. Tell us in the comments if you think it is acceptable for these families to inherit illegally earned money or not. And as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.